After a bit more than a week traveling in Pakistan, I finally reached Hunza Valley, the place I had dreamt about and which made me want to visit this part of the world in the first place. In my first real day in Hunza, I decided to visit Karimabad, formerly known as Baltit, the capital of the valley, and we started with its most celebrated landmark, Baltit Fort. This fortress was the residence of the Mirs of Hunza, the hereditary rulers of the valley for centuries. Its main structure is a pegged timber frame, making it more able to handle seismic activities in the region. The overall style of the fort is quite unique, but was also heavily influenced by Tibetan culture and architecture. Entering the fort, it felt like I was going back through time. The fort was far bigger than I had thought, and was full of objects showcasing daily life in Hunza centuries ago. It was quite similar to what I had discovered in Naga Fort, which isn't surprising as the whole region was connected. The strong historical relations of Hunza with the rest of the world through the Silk Road, and especially with China, were also quite visible. During the visit, I learned more about the history of the rulers of Hunza Valley, the portraits of which hung proudly on the walls. In olden times, a number of small independent states existed in the northern areas of Pakistan, ruled by local kings called mirs or tombs. Among them, Hunza and Nagar were the traditional rival states, situated on opposite sides of the Hunza River. Ruled by the mirs, the Hunza state remained independent until the 19th century, when the British invaded northern Pakistan, forcing the mir to seek refuge in China. Eventually, the royal family was brought back to rule the state, and Hunza enjoyed semi-independence during the British rule. Even after the independence of Pakistan, the Kingdom of Hunza continued to exist until the last year abdicated in 1974, and the valley became fully administratively integrated into Pakistan. The visit ended at the top of the fort, which offered to the rulers of Hunza the magnificent view of their kingdom. From there, the whole central Hunza and Naga valleys were visible, the perfect place to capture the essence of the valley in pictures. Okay, we're still in Hunza. We took the time today to visit a bit uh, the Gilgit Fort, which is uh, a very old fort that was the residence of the Mir, which is the local king. And then uh, we're starting to do some shopping, so I bought some uh, apricot kernel oil and other things like this. And uh, now we are at Cap de Hunza, which is a very famous place here, where they do this walnut cake as well as the apricot cake that are famous all over Gilgit Baltistan. So I'm looking forward to try it. Café de Hunza was a nice experience. The walnut cake, even if a bit dry to my taste, was very yummy. I remained in Karimabad for a bit after this food stop to discover the old streets of the Hunza capital and take some pictures. But quickly enough, we jumped back in the car to reach a nearby town called Altit. The town was very pretty with even more traditional houses than in Karimabad, and crowned with another old fort built at the top of a rock. And as we're making our way to the Altit Fort, 
We passed beautiful sights at the valley and its blooming apricot trees. Altit Fort reflected another important part of the valley's history. Before Gilgit Fort was built, it was the seat of power of the Mirs of Hunza. With more than a thousand years of history, it is one of the oldest buildings in Gilgit Baltistan. Altit Fort acted as a grand display of power to the Mirs of Nagar, the neighboring rival state, and also gave a strategic advantage to the kings of Hunza offering an unmatched visibility of all surrounding mountains and woods in case of an attack. Some 400 years after its construction, during the 17th century, Altit Fort came under a family dispute between two royals, Prince Shah Abbas and Prince Ali Khan. This dispute gave rise to another fort known as the Baltit Fort, which was taken by the elder brother, Prince Shah Abbas, whereas Altit remained under the hold of Prince Ali Khan. The two fought with each other periodically. However, ultimately, Baltit became the capital of Hunza, replacing Altit. The legend says that the younger brother, Ali Khan, was buried alive by his brother inside one of the pillars of the watchtower, which is quite a gruesome way to treat family. The style of Altit Fort is a bit different from Baltit Fort, but both share many commonalities. Details in Altit clearly show the interiority of its construction and a window showing the transition from Buddhism to Islam in the valley. Indeed, Islam came to Hunza between the 14th and 16th century, relatively late compared to other parts of the world. Before that, Buddhism and shamanistic practices were the main religions, and reminders of these are still visible inside the fort, sculpted in the very wood of the building. The view from Altit Fort was breathtaking, especially on the Hunza River. My guide pressured me into taking cool pictures here for me to have mentors of my visit, which I reluctantly did. But quickly enough, we had to leave again for our next destination, further up the valley. After visiting Altid village, we ascended the mountain towards a renowned viewpoint known as Eagle Nest, situated at 2,850 meters above sea level. At the rocky summit, one can behold the entirety of central Hunza, along with prominent landmarks such as Rakapashi Mountains, Spanti Peak, and the Karakram Highway. The site derives its name from a rock formation resembling a seated eagle, while all their nearby rock formations mimic various animals. After soaking the scenery for a few moments, we began our descent towards the Karakoram Highway in direction to Upper Hunza, where further marvels awaited us. En route, we encountered an extraordinary sight, a pristine turquoise lake, seemingly out of place, called Atabad Lake. Surprisingly, this lake didn't even exist merely two decades ago. Its tragic origins can be traced back to 2010, when a devastating landslide obstructed the flow of the Hunza River, resulting in the submersion of over 20 kilometers upstream and isolating the entire Upper Hunza region from the outside world for close to five years. This event had a profound impact on the valley and is a story that is seldom told. But I felt compelled to share it with you for a dedicated video that I already published on the channel. Near Tabat Lake, we made a pit stop to welcome a new guide named Sahid. Before continuing our journey towards what I consider my favorite place in Pakistan, and perhaps the world, the magnificent Pasu Court. Reaching Pasu, we had fully entered the Perhunza, 
a sparsely populated part of the Hunza Valley, which is mostly Wahi speaking, a language from Central Asia related to Persian. Surrounded by nature and beautiful mountains, the Pasu area is without a doubt a dream for road trippers. We stopped the night at one of the only hotels in the area, which was managed by friends of my guides, who are from the same village called Shimsha. Before dinner, I decided to visit the area surrounding the hotel and enjoy the untouched nature. Okay, so today was great. It was amazing. One more day like this in uh, Pakistan. So we visited Hunza, uh, lower Hunza, so around Karimabad, and that was uh, that was a blast. Like the the landscapes were amazing. I know it's amazing a lot. But this is really jaw dropping. This is uh, so unreal in many ways. And right now we are in a place that like kind of breaks my mind because I thought it could not get any better and then we came here it's called Pasu and Pasu is beautiful you have this mountain like like the one just behind me that have cone-shaped uh, peaks a bit like the Dolomites actually and they are just so pretty and this is so photogenic I'm trying to take as many pictures of it as I can but uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can get any better than that because really the bar is very high. Uh, and so tonight we take we uh, tonight we are uh, sleeping here in a hotel in Pasu, and tomorrow we go to Shimsha where a lot of uh, climbers are from. I mean, actually, all of the mountain guides, pretty much in Hunza, come from here. And uh, I've heard it's even higher in terms of altitude close to 3,000 meters. Here we are around 2,500. And uh, yeah, and um, people living there are called Wahi, so they're the Wahi people. The language they speak is close to Tibetan. And uh, yeah, pretty much all the people I've met so far, because my guide is Wahi, uh, are from there, from Shimsha. Um, I'm really looking forward to it, like pretty much every day of this trip. And on this, I wish you a great night, and I see you tomorrow.